So we're going to talk a little bit, Annette, about what brought West Virginia to the place of um, systems change relative to CVI, because not all states really look at CVI the same way your state does. And, <coughs> excuse me, I think you really um, had a vision and had a passion for kids who have kind of, you know, multiple and complex needs, especially those kids who have sensory needs. So can you just, like, take me back a little bit, talk a little bit about where this all kind of occurred in your mind first? Where did this concept come that we should embrace CVI as a real specific project? I think it became apparent um, during a training when you have that aha moment that you can actually improve a person's vision mm -hmm. that with appropriate targeted um, intentional mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. intervention mm -hmm. you can help the person see better and crazy a, idea it's the idea. craziest idea um, at that time there was still a lot of controversy about well, was it the environment change, or did the vision really improve? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, of course, this was way back in 2001, 2002. Isn't that wild? And I yes. was listening to that um, that debate go back and forth mm -hmm. over a course of six months or a year. Um, my partner in crime, Ruth Ann King, and I, and we'd be talking back and forth, and then it's suddenly like, well, what difference does it make whether a, pers a child's vision increases or they're able to use it better. Mm -hmm. The end result is their functioning improves. That's right. That's right. So That's right. who cares about the controversy in CBI? Mm -hmm. Let's go forward. We do no harm. Mm -hmm. um, and so that was about 2001. And can I stop you there? Mm -hmm. Because I also think, it's, tell me if I'm wrong, but I also got the sense that you had a little bit of worry in your heart that maybe these kids were being left out that they were being missed, that they were being overlooked, that they were being misdiagnosed, and that they were being lost. Am, am I right about that? You are right um, in the fact that I am the low incident coordinator. Mm -hmm. um, and I, sometimes I always refer to myself as the yes but kids. Mm -hmm. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> These are children that don't necessarily bubble up. Mm -hmm. We're in a very rural state. Mm -hmm. We have limited funds. So these kids, I feel, don't often get the attention that they need, both vision kids, both hearing kids, and then you put that together with kids with combined loss. Yes. Um, yes. I feel these kids tend to miss out on a lot of opportunities that they mm -hmm. should in terms of really quality education. Exactly. And this is, again, is way back, yes. you know, early on. Yes, and Children can I also add that mm -hmm. West Virginia has some very challenging geography. We have extremely So you have a low number, you know, you small population relative to some other mm -hmm. states and very challenging geography and some areas, communities that could be perceived as being possibly more isolated. Mm -hmm. And yet, you know, um, you took the challenge on. I don't think we had a choice. <laughs> okay. I don't think okay. we had a choice. We knew that these kids needed services. Yes. Um, we knew the services were not in West Virginia. Mm -hmm. um, we just knew we ha we just had to go forward. I mean, you, yes. you can't not go forward. Right. Um, and so to that end, there were several things that kind of occurring simultaneously. Um, as you know, the director of the DeafBlind Project, now mm -hmm. called Sensibility, and my project coordinator, Ruth Ann King, and I, we were trying to talk about how can we make this impact. Mm -hmm. We knew about the impact of early intervention, and of course, way back then, it was the window was up until age three. Mm -hmm. We mm -hmm. now know the window continues. Yes. yes. But back then, you plasticity, know. Plasticity, visual pl plasticity, yes. yes. But, yes. but at that time, it was we won this critical. Yes. March. Yes. Um, and so we pulled in um, Pam Roush, who mm -hmm. is the director of Birth to Three, mm -hmm. um, and we said, you know, help us. We've got this problem. We, you know, we need to work together. Um, West Virginia, by nature, is an extremely collaborative state. That is true. Uh, so she jumped on board. Mm -hmm. um, because we're a small project, she offered to underwrite and help fund mm -hmm. the training. We had among our 
projects around the country. There were a few projects themselves mm -hmm. that were starting to ask the same questions I were. What about these kids? How mm -hmm. do you serve these kids? Mm -hmm. And, and that, that was, was within the deaf blind community. That was in the deaf blind community. And those but, but even before that, wasn't there an eligibility thing that you thought about? About eligibility, keep going. <laughs> so when, even before the, we started thinking about the other projects, and we'll talk about that in just a minute, um, wasn't there even a question about the state guidelines for how a child oh, qualified as visual impairment, visually impaired? And I think in probably, again, in 2000-ish, um, maybe even 1999, you tackled and you challenged and tackled um, <laughs> the wording that made a child eligible for vision services. Right. Correct? you want to just mention that a little bit? Um, at that time, I think it was probably about 99. Um, the eligibility was all based on ocular. Mm -hmm. um, and then when we started learning more about CVI, that it is a visual impairment, mm -hmm. that it is in the processing and how they interpret the world, um, we then went back to who is responsible for serving these kids. Yes. Um, in my mind, it was the teachers of the visually impaired. Mm -hmm. uh, we have some awesome teachers of the visually impaired in West mm -hmm. Virginia. Of course, that's my passion. I do the vision as well as the hearing. So, yes. of course, I'm going to turn to my community, my mm -hmm. VI community. Mm -hmm. This is a visual impairment. We now know that. These teachers need to be responsible for that. So we went to our policy and embedded mm -hmm. um, eligibility that not only the ocular, but also those kids that have the characteristics of CVI and have the diagnosis of CVI. Mm -hmm. So that was, we, we did add that. Probably one of the very first states, if not at that time, perhaps the only state that did that. I think that took a lot of for, foresight, courage, and um, really commitment to advocate for children who are called visually impaired, who are rendered visual, visually impaired by virtue of the collection of those 10 characteristics that makes them not just perceptually different visually, but actually visually impaired, had the courage to actually put that wording right in those regulations, which is wonderful. And I don't think you did it with much um, confusion. Well, I think I, it was I don't, just very clear to you. I don't it think it was done. courage. It, be, you're, <laughs> it, it wasn't courage. I mean, people asked me in the past, they yes. have asked me, how did you get that in? And it perplexes me. We have at that point established it was a visual impairment. Mm -hmm. Therefore, it belongs in the caseload of teachers of the visually impaired. Yes. Therefore, it needs to be part of policy. It seems to be the next logical step to take. Mm -hmm. um, so mm -hmm. we took it in West Virginia. And nobody screamed and yelled and mm -hmm. kicked their feet. It just mm -hmm. happened. So then, t all right, so fast forward again. So now you've noticed that some of your colleagues in the country, especially in sort of maybe the eastern part um, mm -hmm. where you've collaborated because of, again, geography, were also um, seeing that this population of kids at CVI were bubbling up. We saw they were seeing the population equal to us bubbling up. More than this bubbling up, they were seeing children with these characteristics bubbling up. Yes, you're right. You're right. Instead of CVI kids, yes, you're right. Bubbling up and wondering who they were and wondering who they were. Yes. Um, and so, we had identified, as you said, this within policy. It does belong on the caseload of the teachers and visually impaired, but we did not have that expertise in our state. Mm -hmm. um, we we would do a training on CVI. I believe mm -hmm. you came in. Other people have come in. But it didn't necessarily stick. Mm -hmm. Some of the teachers would bubble up, but they needed more intensive, ongoing mm -hmm. training. Right. Um, and so with the other states, there were four of us. It was Vermont, Delaware, Maryland. And you. And West Virginia. <laughs> <laughs> Who was that? I will help you with that part, yes. Uh -huh. In West Virginia. <laughs> so we all decided that we wanted to come together, um, share resources, share funding, share vision. Yes. And to create a pool of experts in the state yes. to help guide the state through that. And so, um, and so they were the first group of CVI mentors mm -hmm. that were established nationally. Mm -hmm. Yes, they Shortly were. after the New England group also did a CVI advisor yes. group, but you guys were the initial group to we start were, that. We were the first. We also looked at establishing that in West Virginia as a systems change piece. Although we were the deaf blind project, mm -hmm. I could not in good conscience say just because a child doesn't have a hearing loss, we're not going to serve them. Right. So in West Virginia, we were adamant on identifying all the kids with cortical visual impairment. Yes. 
we were in partnership with Birth to Three, and so they were agreeable as we progressed in training our four mentors that they would change their systems. Mm -hmm. Because we decided to choose mentors based on those who wanted to learn, mm -hmm. those who brought other perspectives. Yes. Um, and as a result, we ended up with two teachers of the visually impaired, a developmental specialist, and an occupational therapist. Right. How many were there all together in that first group about in the, West Virginia? Four. Four. Four mentors. Four mentors. And so those folks carried on their shoulders the voluntary responsibility Absolutely. of signing up for years of additional training and taking a leadership role within their state to help build more capacity. Now, what made you think that they should not be teachers of the visually impaired? Because other states in that collective the, of the CVI Mentor Project also chose people who might not be in vision. What was the thinking behind that? I think that goes back to where we were at the time. There was still a lot of debate about whether it belonged the primary responsibility of the teacher of the visually impaired. Mm -hmm. um, I think I, in West Virginia we made the leap Mm -hmm. that it should be. I'm not sure that across the country and, and for the others in the state that it should be. Mm -hmm. And and so when when Ruth Ann and I sat down and said, what are the primary characteristics that we want? Mm -hmm. In a mentor. In a mentor. Mm -hmm. We wanted that commitment, mm -hmm. that dedication, uh, that really foundational in-gut belief in the family, mm -hmm. in the structure, in the mm -hmm. empowering the family. Mm -hmm. Those were the qualities. We did a little rubric on, on what were the mm -hmm. qualifications that we really wanted that's going to take this forward. Because yes. they've been with us eight years, ten years. This yes. started in 2002, yes. 2003. It's ten years now, I believe. Yeah. And so did, um, did, were there, did you just take the first four people that oh. showed up? Well, how did you? We did an application process. Uh -huh. We did um, a lot of marketing. Mm -hmm. We told them we weren't going to pay them. We didn't have money. Mm -hmm. It's always special. But it's, it's always special. Good to be right up front about that. Uh, well, we just mm -hmm. didn't want any misunderstandings. We, um, you know, gave background and training on CVI. Told them where we were going. Mm -hmm. Told them we didn't even know where we were going to end up. Right. Um, but we wanted a commitment from them of at least five years. It may be more. We don't know where we're going. Mm -hmm. um, and then we opened it up in an application process. And again, it comes back to the beauty of West Virginia. Mm -hmm. We have such a strong, collaborative, passionate people out there mm -hmm. um, that we had about 20, 25 applicants mm -hmm. of really people who wanted to take this journey with us, mm -hmm. knowing they weren't going to get paid, mm -hmm. knowing we didn't know where we were going to end up, knowing we didn't know what we were going to expect of them, and they jumped on board. And knowing pretty upfront that we were going to require a lot of them in this process, yes. that we this was not a pro forma process, that they were going to be held to an extraordinarily right. high standard. And they said, pick me. That's yes. right. And so we had these applications. It was about a four to five application. We did phone interviews. Yes. Um, both Ruth Ann and I prioritized them, mm -hmm. and we prioritized them independently. Then we came back together mm -hmm. and made a final priority list. And then out of the top, I don't remember how many, we asked you to do a mm -hmm. um, unbiased interview. Mm -hmm. Um, and then you took mm -hmm. your rating, we put it with ours, and then we selected our four mentors. Mm -hmm. And so, we had wonderful mentors in West Virginia. We did, we did. We yes. still do. In fact, that's true. So uh, so then the training went forward. Four years passed. Um, folks went through this intensive training. What did you have to do for the mentors so that they could do their job, so that they could actually be effective? Because if they functioned in different roles, how were they going to be able to now fit this additional piece in without just completely collapsing under the pressure of having an additional job to do? I mean, oh, you know, I knew the, use the analogy, and I always use it, that changing a system is like turning the Titanic around in a river. It's not any one thing. Mm -hmm. It's several things going on simultaneously at the same time. Mm -hmm. um, when, the, when we knew of the mentors that we wanted to select, mm -hmm. um, then we started almost a bartering system. <laughs> Very West Virginia. Very West Virginia. <laughs> um, where we, I met, for example, one of our mentors was from the West Virginia Schools for the Deaf and Blind. Mm -hmm. So I met with the superintendent 
and said that I will provide your staff member with research-based quality state-of-the-art training that you would never be able to afford ever mm -hmm. and we will get them up to an expertise level mm -hmm. um, but in return in bringing that knowledge back to your school I need them to be available to other districts and other teachers and people out there mm -hmm. um, and so they agreed not only to release them for training but then to give me two days a month mm -hmm that I could use them, that they would pay them, because again, we did mm -hmm. not have much money. Mm -hmm. um, and then I did that with all of the other uh, counties and districts and agencies we had, with the exception of one that was in private practice. Mm -hmm. She was a birth to three provider, and then we found a subsequent grant so that she would not earn money by going to training, but she wouldn't lose money. Mm -hmm. So we tried to support her mm -hmm. that way. Mm -hmm. um, so that's how we built the system to get them released. And then... Um, so and that you, actually, um, you actually negotiated that on behalf of those mentors. Mm -hmm. So they didn't personally have to go to their principal, to their mm -hmm. administrator, and say, please let me do this. I've been trained to do this. Please let no. me do that. So you, as a state level, administrator yes. said I, I'll, I'll arrange this on your right. behalf which seems like a, a very important step a very important step so then what is what was the job what is the job of these mentors it's morphed it's changed it continues to change mm -hmm. um, but what did it start as what were they started set out, out to that do? they would go initially to do um, CBI assessments mm -hmm. and intervention mm -hmm. um, as they as the skills level became more competent, they became more mm -hmm. competent in the skills. I think if you remember, um, as our trainer for our CVI mentors, that it took until year two until they were at a reliability on the CVI on range, the CVI range mm -hmm. that they felt that we all felt that they were competent to start mm -hmm. going forth. Mm -hmm. um, so initially they would go in and actually do the assessment, mm -hmm. do the report, guide the teachers and the teams in the mm -hmm. intervention. Mm -hmm. That in itself has morphed as we have grown mm -hmm. since we do recognize that it is responsibility of teachers of the visually impaired, mm -hmm. that they should be doing the CBI assessment mm -hmm. and they should be guiding the team so that then they became, we allowed the teachers to choose whether to have a mentor come in and do the assessment, mm -hmm. whether to have the mentor come in and consult with the TVI and let the TVI do the assessment, Mm -hmm. or to come in and let a parallel assessment come in and then they put the reports together. However worked best in the district. And we mm -hmm. kind of negotiated mm -hmm. that and helped them talk. And so what if the teacher of the visually impaired um, wasn't familiar with doing the CVI range and somebody who was an OT as a CVI mentor came mm -hmm. in and worked side by side with the teacher of the visually impaired? Was it that offensive to the teacher no. of the visually impaired no. to have this no. person who's non-vision person do this? No, and I think that's the type of system that we live in um, in West Virginia. Um, being the state coordinator, the teacher of the visually impaired, being the one that provided the training for the CVI mentor, being the one that does the training and coordinating the trainings for many of the TVIs in the state when we have our state trainings. They've heard they've heard me say many, many times, this is your responsibilities, these are the resources that we have provided this you. This is how we can support This you. is how we can support you. Right. Um, take advantage of it. So I would suggest that it, the reason that it seemed to work, that a TVI could work side by side with someone who knew, knew more about CBI and might not be a teacher of the visually impaired, I would suggest that part of the reason that worked was because you set the standard. We that. set the standard. I've had to, I had to call a few districts because we had a developmental specialist mm -hmm. who was skilled in birth to three actually mm -hmm. going in and doing CBI assessments of high school students. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so that kind of makes administrators mm -hmm. yeah, sit up I, and say, I'm not <laughs> sure what's going on here. <laughs> um, but it would take a few conversations. Mm -hmm. um, Along the way, we've, we've changed the system so that when they do a functional vision assessment, which is the CBI assessment, that the county and the district's TVI must sign off on that. Mm -hmm. 
So we may have a developmental specialist actually doing it, but we have the TVI signing off. So the TVI, it. so it's real clear that the teacher of the visually impaired who may not have done the CVI range themselves has agreed that this other person can come in. So right. you've put a lot of checks and balances in, which is we really, have. really good. We've tried. We have also with the birth of three, because within their structure, when a child has a visual impairment, um, they have to be seen by a certified teacher of the visually impaired. Mm -hmm. uh, however, Pam Roush made it a little exception within the policy that if they're one of the four CVI mentors, those people are qualified to serve mm -hmm. kids with cortical visual impairments, enabling mm -hmm. the occupational therapist as well as developmental specialists to go in as the VI specialist for Got that it. CVI kid. Got it, because they had special training in, in CVI. So that's pretty impressive. Um, how do you keep track of kids with CVI? Is it just, um, you just assume that the districts are going to have this information and you assume that the districts will keep track of kids with CVI or is there a more central way that you keep track of them? Um, it is a central way. We, and I say this now, but it's a work in progress. Yes. It's always a work in what progress. Yes. Um, we have a protected website. Well, we have a website that has a lot of CVI training where these mm -hmm. clips will be yes. posted as well. Yes. And on that, we have a protected website for the um, the Eye Institute of West Virginia, where mm -hmm. the pediatric ophthalmologist can go up and pull down CVI assessments. We have all of the CVI assessments that are done by the mentors, um, as well as the CVI partners now. They get uploaded to this. So there. So if John Smith was a child with CVI there is a place in which all of John Smith's CVI ranges live. That's right. The only people that have access that, to that um, would be the pediatric ophthalmologists, mm -hmm. um, both the Sensibilities Project mm -hmm. um, and the CVI mentors. Mm -hmm. um, and what benefit do you think that's been to, to have a central place where you kind of keep track of all the kids at CVI? That's huge and a lot of things. Um, administratively, for my own curiosity, I can pull up all the CVI assessments on John Smith, see that he's getting them on a yearly basis to see if he's not, yes. to see how he's progressed. Um, within a district, when I have a teacher and they say, you know, I have a child diagnosed with CVI, I don't know where to begin, I can pull that up and I say, do you realize that there's been assessment, there's been two assessments done, um, and I can send them the assessment, mm -hmm. I can tell them who did the assessment, whether they need an updated one, mm -hmm. just to make sure that mm -hmm. the files are on track. Um, so it has a lot of different benefits mm -hmm. on that mm -hmm. way as well. I can send it to the parents. It's a, yes, yes. amazing how many parents often don't get copies yes. of the, the reports range, yes, on the yes. children. Yes, yes, um, so yes. we have we've done that. So we've yes. used it for a variety. So you actually are familiar with most of the names, a lot of the names of the actual children with CVI in your state. I mean, not that you've memorized them, but you yeah. would have access to them yes. at any time. That's impressive. And I do that anyway because of my job as the coordinator of the mm -hmm. VI. So mm -hmm. I would be able, again, we have a very strong network in West Virginia. Mm -hmm. So I have mm -hmm. my connections that way as well mm -hmm. for all children with visual impairments. So what's the um, future for CVI? What do you want to see happen next? Or is is it a matter now of just maintaining where <laughs> we are? Um, because you now have uh, you have CVI mentors, now CVI advisors, who were the folks who were trained in the second four years so we had, you know, we had the first four years for the, the core mentors, and then they have trained, and we trained, and, you know, many more. So you have this nice network of people who have either eight years of training, four years of training, and I guess a few that have up to ten years of training. What's next? What, how do you, where do you go? It this? seems like, and it has always seemed since we started down this journey, that every time we take a step forward, we realize how many more steps we need to take. Mm. It, that that tunnel keeps getting longer. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> it, the more we train, the more training we need to do. That's right. Um, so right there's now, a real maintenance part of There this. is a definite maintenance of it. We have seen the number of children identified with cortical visually impaired just significantly increase. It's un, we're unable to keep contain them. Mm -hmm. We are seeing our pediatric ophthalmologist, which is really nice, really getting a handle in diagnosing these kids, mm -hmm. um, which was has been a process. Yes, uh, and they are doing yes. an excellent job. 
But there's going to always be a need for training. Mm -hmm. There's going to always be a need to keep the teachers out front, to keep them aware, to keep pushing mm -hmm. that message. Right. Um, I still think that many of us across the country, not just in West Virginia, still have our focus on ocular kids. Mm -hmm. I agree. Um, and I see the caseloads changing. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure that all of the teachers have embraced that change. Um, I have a wonderful teacher, the visually impaired, who is extremely gifted. Mm -hmm. Her love is ocular kids mm -hmm. at first, um, and she said, she made a comment to me just about a year ago, and she said, you know, Annette, I'm getting more and more children with CVI, and I didn't know I had to, I didn't know I was supposed to listen <laughs> that hard back then. <laughs> I would like to rewind and go yes, through it again. We do, we do. We do. Yes. Um, and I think that's always going to be the case. And how lovely that, you know, that person was upfront about that. So I, I think what I really would like to ask you finally is, you know, what drives this passion? What drives this passion for these kids? What drives it with you? I don't know. I so much believe in a level playing field. Mm -hmm. And I don't believe these kids get it. Mm -hmm. I, I I just don't know. I mean, mm -hmm. the with children with cortical vision impairment, you have the opportunity to change a child's vision in the palm of your hands. I don't know what else is more exciting. Yes. I just don't. I um, and I also want to address your, um, if I can put words in your mouth, which you know I never, ever shy away from <laughs> doing with people, but I, I would like to say, as long as I've known you, I've always known your passion also for um, being able to put yourself in the position of the parents and to think about what this means to them and what they deserve. Well, I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you very much.